Good morning or good afternoon, whatever you're watching this. We welcome you as we come together for our online worship from St. John's United Church of Christ in Newport, Kentucky. As always, I thank you and welcome you as we participate together and experience this worship service. I pray it will be a blessing for you, that it will help renew you and strengthen you in your walk of discipleship with Jesus. This week we're beginning um, what's going to be an unfolding series over the next few months as we start taking a bigger view of where God might be taking the church in our world today. Obviously the world has many issues, many struggles, and the church is more needed than ever to help reach out and make this world how God wants it to be. So I hope you'll invite us, if you're a member of St. John's, this is may or may uh, apply a little more directly to you as we talk about our own church, but whatever, whatever church you're from or wherever you're watching, I hope you'll find uh, some purpose and meaning with this. And maybe you can take it back to your own congregation and say, hey, this guy has some ideas for um, how we need to be looking big picture, longer view. Anyway, we're glad you're here today. We welcome you because we like to invite anyone, no matter where they are in life's journey, to participate with us. Thank you for being here today, and um, God bless our time together. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. We follow you, Jesus, today as we worship, in words of love and devotion sung and spoken, in service and kindness, 
and shared life and prayer-bound hearts. And all we need to do to follow you as we leave this place is to continue saying and doing to others what we bring to you in this hour. And so we pray for praise and affirmation to empower our families and communities, for confession and forgiveness, to reconcile personal and national enemies, and to lead us into integrity and goodness, for thanksgiving and generosity, to curb our greed and overcome poverty, for intercession and compassion to heal the broken, defend the weak and guide the powerful. As you feed us now, Jesus, in our worship, may we become again your body which nourishes the world and which embraces all people with kindness. Amen. Please join me in the responsive prayer of adoration and confession. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gathers the poor of the earth. Glorious is our God who wipes away the tears of sorrow. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gives inheritance to the meek. Glorious is our God who satisfies the hunger of the just. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gives mercy to the merciful. Glorious is our God who gives vision to the pure in heart. Wonderful is the God of Christ who adopts the peacemakers. Glorious is our God who lifts high the persecuted. Wonderful is the God of Christ who finds the lost. Glorious is our God who awakens the dead. God, you are holy, holy, one and complete. You are light and life and love and fullness. You can be no other. You are beauty and goodness and truth, brilliant and dazzling. And it is we who must change, we who come to this place to worship. It is we who must choose to gaze on your holiness and beauty and be changed into glory. And so here we are. Here are prayers for ourselves, for others, and for the Church of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for this morning is from the Hebrew Psalm, Psalm 34, verses 4 to 11 and verses 15 to 21. The Lord watches over the righteous and listens to their cries, but he opposes those who do evil, so that when they die, they are soon forgotten. The righteous call to the Lord, and he listens. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who are discouraged. He saves those who have lost all hope. Good people suffer many troubles, but the Lord saves them from them all. The Lord preserves them completely. Not one of their bones is broken. Evil will kill the wicked. Those who hate the righteous will be punished.
Our second scripture lesson is from the New Testament letters, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 to chapter 5, verse 2. Don't grieve God. Don't break His heart. His Holy Spirit, moving and breathing in you, is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for Himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. Watch what God does, and then you do it, like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with Him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Now let's take a moment to be the church in prayer together, wherever you are. We come together in spirit. And please note, our if you're following along in the little downloaded uh, bulletin for the online service, the prayer is a little different today. I'm going to allow a a little bit of silent prayer to begin. And then I'm going to lead you through a number of petitions. Um, I will read my part, you read your part, and I'll read it aloud too so you'll know. But at the end of each petition, I'm going to allow a, a few seconds of silence so that we are in a rhythm of praying and being silent before God together. And at the end of that um, series of petitions, then we join in the Lord's Prayer. So let us take a moment. I ask you, I invite you, to get comfortable and take a couple of very nice deep breaths. Three to be exact, three cleansing breaths. And as we come to the third one, let us be together in silent prayer. Lord, hear these things we pray for ourselves and for others. In this time where we come to you and still our thoughts for a moment and try to discern our hearts beating with yours and our spirits enlivened and moving with your spirit. God, bless those who are poor in spirit, who feel empty inside and who dread the day. God, bless those who mourn and grieve, who ache with loss for someone much loved. God, bless those who are meek, who do not grasp or shout or demand to be first in line. God bless the people who are hungry for justice and who cannot wait for everyone to have their rights. God bless all who are merciful, who have learned to forgive even those who hurt them hard. God, bless all who are pure in heart, in whom there is no vengefulness, but only love. God, bless the peacemakers, the ones who, by their words and deeds, can change the world. God, bless the persecuted ones. Keep them safe from those who would hurt them. God, so rich in your blessings for your children, we rejoice 
in your promises and in your boundless and transforming grace. Hear us now as we gather in one, one voice to pray the words of the living Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God's grace reaches out to all of us and calls us to live as citizens of heaven, now working together with one heart and mind. We bring our gifts to share the grace and help others know heaven on earth in a world that is often hellish and cruel. We bring our gifts for the work of justice, healing, and peace.
Friends, our gospel lesson for this morning, um, which I'm reading in a combination of two versions, uh, comes from Matthew chapter 5. And those who are familiar with this part of the gospel of Matthew will recognize these verses as what we call the Beatitudes, which is part of a larger teaching from Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount. I'm reading verses five, or chapter 5, 1 through 10, and 43 through 48. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're familiar with the old written law that says love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer. For then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives us his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill run sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. Here ends the reading of our gospel. May we be blessed in reading it, hearing it, and pondering its meaning for ourselves today. Have you ever been on a boat in choppy or fast water? I saw a news story today that this weekend is the paddle fest uh, in this area uh, in, on the Ohio River with all these kayaks paddling up and down the river. And it made me think of some times when I've been in a, in a kayak or a, a canoe. And one in particular was a time when I was with a youth trip up in Ohio on the Mohican River, which is right in the middle of the state. And we and a, one of the kids' parents, one of the dads, was in the back of the boat. I was in the front of a canoe. And we were coming down this river into a bend. And the water was getting fast. Uh, we could see the ripples and then bigger ripples. But right where the ripples got biggest, where the water was going fastest, there was a turn. So we came into that water and we were paddling, doing our best to turn the boat. But the boat wasn't turning. We were picking up speed. The river went this way. We kept going that way. And pretty soon there's a tree and boom. Fortunately, no one was hurt. We didn't damage the rented canoe but it sure shook the you-know-what out of us. It was one of the hardest impacts I've ever had at a boat. I want to take up this metaphor today of being in a, a boat on, on, in fast water or uncertain water. Let's take up this metaphor because I want us as a church um, to talk about where our boat is headed. Where is our boat going? And is it out of control or is it under control? If it's in control, who's controlling it? Who's running it? Is our boat leaking? Are the sails torn 
and needed mending if you're thinking in terms of a sailboat? Or is the motor running well? Is our radar turned on and showing us what's out there ahead to watch out for? These are all, of course, big picture questions. And churches today, including ours, and if you're watching this and aren't from St. John's, um, I hope you'll still get some meaning out of this because I'm, I'm preaching this mainly to our congregation. But this does apply to all Christians, and I, I believe in all churches today, that churches need to start taking a longer view of who and what they are uh, to see the big picture. And so starting today and over, the, over a number of weeks and months, um, several months in fact, I want to start looking at the bigger picture, the longer view. Um, and today is just a beginning introduction to that, a prequel, if you will. The next few weeks will be a prequel. Um, and after that, we'll talk about uh, what some of the content that we're going to be dealing with. But to do this introduction today, I want to introduce to you a video. And it's by Phyllis Tickle. Now, if you don't know who Phyllis Tickle is, uh, she was one of the great religious writers and authors of the 20th century, passed away just a few years ago. Came into prominence, but she became the, uh, the religion editor for Publishers Weekly and profoundly um, influenced how religion, uh, books about religion and spiritual life became center stream in our culture. And she was a great teacher about church history. She is the one who named the times that we're in today that people started to, to embrace. We are in a period of history called the Great Emergence. So in this video, she's going to talk about what that is and remind us that we go through something like this about every 500 years. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to a, a video clip by Phyllis Tickle. It only runs about three minutes or so. The Great Emergence is the name we're giving to the current upheaval that is certainly uh, across all of Western culture uh, and to some extent globally. It tries to name something that happens every 500 years. The Episcopal tradition has a bishop, a Bishop Mark Dyer, who says when he gets right here that to understand the Great Emergence, what you really have to understand first is that about every 500 years the church feels compelled to have a giant rummage sale and we're having one. And he's absolutely right. 500 years ago was, of course, the Great Reformation of 1517. 500 years before that was the Great Schism of 1051. 500 years before that was the Council of Chalcedon, the Fall of Rome, the age of Gregory the Great, just to keep the greats going. 500 years before that was what's now being called increasingly the Great Transformation, the change of the eras. If we were a Jewish audience, some rabbi would rise up and say, it's not a Christian phenomenon, it's a Judeo-Christian, because 500 years from the Great Transformation, what we have, of course, is the Babylonian captivity uh, and the end of First Temple Judaism, the birth of Second. 500 years before that, we have the Davidic dynasty out of which Meshua is to come. So, the Great Emergence, it's an every 500-year phenomenon. We're just lucky. We get to live through one. I don't think anybody knows exactly where the Great Emergence is going, much less where the Christianity, the emerging or emergent or what uh, Christianity is coming out of it, is going to go exactly. But there's some contours uh, that are, are, are clearly visible right now and can be described. For one thing, this thing is radically Jesus-oriented. It takes the position, he meant what he said, uh, which is fairly radical. It is definitely a communal, even to the point that about a quarter of it is probably engaging in, in a form of monasticism, as a matter of fact. It's post denominational, it's post-Protestant, it is uh, largely based in, uh, in virtual reality as opposed to bricks and mortar and organizes itself on the net. Uh, it is deeply concerned with theologies of religion that uh, get rid of, of Christian particularity or exclusivitism. Uh, it is dipping back ardently, if you will, to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd century to try to find there the passionate parts of the Christian liturgy that sustained um, the church during those dreadful years of persecution and then to incorporate those into itself. So wherever it's going, there's every reason right now to rejoice that God is doing a new thing amongst us and it's called emerging or emergent Christianity. So, 
You've watched this little clip. You've been introduced to this notion of the great emergence. Did you grasp some of what she was saying? I mean, she does other uh, teachings on this that go on for hours and hours because it's such a complex subject. But I hope you can see some of the implications for churches that this time we're entering, that we're transitioning into, that we're emerging into, is a radically Jesus-oriented time. Jesus expects us to follow him and to do what he did and said. Maybe you've seen that billboard out there it says, where it says, you know, you know that those good commandment, the great commandment thing? I meant that, you know. It is a time that is also communal and contemplative. We're going to talk about what being contemplative means, but that means embracing some of the classic spiritual disciplines like meditation and silence, contemplative prayer, listening prayer. How many of our prayers are talking to God, but how much time do we actually take just to shut our mouths and listen to God? to practice silence, to practice the presence of God. Churches in the future will be profoundly contemplative. In fact, the General Synod of the United Church of Christ, which just ended a week or so ago, brought a a resolution to the floor, the the national meeting of the church, and asked our churches, and this resolution passed unanimously, I believe, to consider becoming contemplatives in action to embrace classic spiritual discipline so that we can hear God's voice better because our future depends on it. It's also the emergence, the great emergence, an age of the spirit. That's another term that Phyllis Tickle often uses. It's where we learn how to more, because of our growing spiritual depth, learn to rightly discern the inner authority of the spirit rather than relying on the outer authority of the church all the time or doctrines or dogmas. If you can listen with a profoundly tuned inner, listen to the profoundly tuned ear to the inner voice of God speaking, you will know what is right without someone else having to tell you. This is an age that we will see the end, thank God, of Christian triumphalism. You know, where Christianity is my way or highway and all other religions are, well, if you believe in another religion, you're going to hell. There are many, many Christians who still uh, abide by that. It's an end to dueling denominationalism. You know, that my denomination is right and yours is wrong. In fact, it's denominationalism itself is slowly fading away. It's going to be an era of more working together and embracing one another. It's online, web-based. It's going to be more pluralistic, more diverse, more worldwide, and more interfaith. We're going to have more interactions with other wisdom traditions, and that can only bless us. It's going to be a movement, this emergence, that embraces science and evolution and human reason instead of rejecting them, helping us to find a faith that makes sense for our time, living faith for our time. One of the reasons why churches are emptier and emptier is because the classic old doctrines and teachings don't make sense in light of what we've learned about the creation and the cosmos, it's time to update that a little bit. We have to take the Bible too seriously to ever read it literally again. It's also going to be an environmental faith, a faith that helps people care for the earth as well as caring for each other, care for the unity of creation, and it sees a unity of body, spirit, and the universe around us. We are, after all, made of star stuff. So the great emergence is bringing reform, renewal, and innovation, just like all those other past big upheavals in history have done. Um, And it's about time, really. It's about time in the church that we took this seriously and saw this big picture. We do it in other aspects of life. I mean, literally, how many of you would go to a dentist or a doctor who still practices dentistry or medicine the way they did 50 or 100 years ago? Hey, doctor, I see you got a bucket of leeches there. You know? um, or how many of you would um, eat food produced by 
well, maybe that's not a good analogy. I would eat food made by a farmer 100 years ago, but farmers certainly don't farm like they did even 50 years ago. We embrace technology and advancement to help the world be better in all these other areas. It's time that the church emerged into this new reality that God is taking it. This journey will take some time. It will even take months, perhaps even years, but that's okay. And I want to make no mistake. We are all on this journey, whether we admit it or not, whether we think we want to be on it or not. The boat is moving, and we can't stop it. The emergence is happening, just like all those other great movements happen. It's underway, and it's sweeping us up in the long arc of history. So the only thing we have to do is make one of two choices. There are only two choices for us. Go along for the ride with God and learn to pilot the boat with God to let God have his hands on the helm, her hands on the helm, as much as ours. Or the second alternative is to jump ship. Find some nice little safe, dry beach somewhere and stick our heads in the sand. Those are the only two options, friend, because it's happening whether we want it to or not. The first option can lead us to a meaningful and vital future where faith is alive in new ways, where we see scripture opening up and exploding with meaning for our lives. The second leads to spiritual death and eventually the death of the church. So let's get started. Let's look at some of these issues. And again, today we're only scratching. I'm just really beginning to scratch the surface But I want to touch upon one of the most profound and crucial issues that will keep coming front and center as we embrace the great emergence. And that is the issue of how we see God, our image of God, if you will. We don't, again, have time today to get into this in detail, but we will look at it more in the future. But this is, remember, a prequel, an introduction. And I want to say as an introduction that it is necessary because our image of God creates who we are. Let me say that again. I'll say it more personally. Your image of God creates you. It creates the world. It creates how you see God, which infects how you see others and how you see yourself. It's the foundational image of our lives. Did you ever Notice, when you look at the Bible, there are at least two different images of God in the Scripture. I've lost track over the time how many people have come up to me and said, I I get the Bible, I love the Bible, but I can't get the Old Testament. Because that Old Testament God is a God of violence and vengeance and blood and retribution, you know. but, But the God of Jesus is different. So we almost have like these two different images of God, but yet we say it's the same God. So how can that be? What's going on here? The Old Testament vengeful God who wipes out whole towns, whole nations with his people? Or the New Testament God, it's Jesus who says, I say to you, love your enemies. Let's look at these scriptures real quick. Um, The ones we have for today. And the psalm shows us the old school God, the old way of thinking, what I call the old narrative. Um, Picking up at verse 17, we got this idea that the righteous call out to the Lord. God listens to the righteous, you know, the people who are good. And he rescues them from all our troubles, says the psalmist. The Lord is near to those who are discouraged. He saves those who have lost all hope. Good people suffer many troubles, but the Lord saves them from them all. The Lord preserves completely. Not one of their bones will be broken. Really? Really? Is that your experience? We want to believe that, but do righteous people always, are they always rescued from all their troubles? Sometimes they are persecuted because of their righteousness. Sometimes despite all the best that we do, we still get sick. People who we call saints of the church still have heart attacks and get cancer. Babies still get sick and die in families that are church-going, God-loving families. Their bones get broken. Not everything always works out for good just because you love and believe in God. 
Then there's the second part of that, that, that myth that God will kill all the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be punished. Well, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes not. Sometimes it seems the more that you, especially white-collar evil people, can get away with murder and reap great benefit without any consequence. So this God, this is a more simplistic understanding of God that we have in the Old Testament. Whereas we have a radically different kind that we see in Ephesians. God, writes Paul, The Holy Spirit is moving and breathing in you the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Mostly what God does is love you. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. Not a mean-spirited, vengeful, punishing God who keeps lists of right and wrong, but a God of extravagant love. A God who gives everything of himself to us. That's what we get from the Ephesians. And from the gospel text, (laughs) this is the Christianity of the future here in the Beatitudes. This is what the future of the church looks like. The church of the future, the, the Christian of the future and the church of the future takes this radical teaching of Jesus seriously. What do these different images teach us? Which ones should we follow? Which ones um are, are better, we learn that through spiritual discernment. How did they get in the Bible? We'll talk about that. Again, this is a preview of what is to come. But I want to leave you with this, with this last, re, uh, last reminder that we are on this journey. We can't escape the journey. And I want us all to go on this journey together, to look with fresh eyes and open hearts to where God is taking the church. And I want us to understand, here's a preview of the ending of this whole series, that it's all about discerning God's vision for us. And that vision is what Paul says there, or what Jesus says there at the end of our gospel. In a word, what I'm saying to you is grow up. Spiritually grow up. Your kingdom subjects, more than any other um, aspect of your life, you are a subject of the realm of God. So live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously. Can we abide those two words deep more deeply in our lives? Right there, generous and gracious. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. Well, I hope you'll come along with me on this ride for the great emergence. And at the very least... Let's learn right now to start treating each other more graciously and more generously as we go on this trip together. Amen.
Thanks again for joining us for our worship this week. Our benediction this week is a responsive one. So if you have the bulletin, follow along. If not, just listen as we respond together to what God has done today. Jesus says to his disciples, Happy are you needy ones, the kingdom of God is yours. Happy are you who are hungry, you will be satisfied. Happy are you who weep now, you will be filled with laughter. Rejected, insulted, happy are you. Be glad and dance with joy. Jesus said, take up your cross. We will follow you, O Christ, into the needs of the world, into the truth of our lives, into the joys and pains of our hearts, into the presence of God. Amen. May God's peace be with you.